So I will present the work that we did, uh, which is related to emotion bubbles. So let's get started. Okay, so it's already known that um, disasters like earthquake or terrorist attacks, typhoons, they can leave certain um, negative effect on the psychological states of people who experienced it or witnessed it. But all of these are examples of the short-term upheavals. But when we come to the pandemic, we can certainly see that it's not a short-term upheaval, it's a long-term upheaval with some prolonged uncertainty and isolation, especially COVID-19, which lasts for more than half uh, two years, right? And actually epidemic psychology is not a new field of studies. Um, it was actually introduced by a person named uh, Philip Strong in 1990s in his paper, Epidemic Psychology Model, where he argues that people experiencing pandemic, they go through three psychosocial stages, which starts with the fear phase where people are panicking and acting some acting irrational. And then they move to the interpretation phase where they try to understand what's happening, who is, the, he, who is to blame for the situation. And as a result, they come up with some conclusions and make some future strategies to deal with the situations, which is the action phase. And surprisingly, um, the Strong's model, although being very old, it actually holds in the uh, social media conversations, which was found by several studies uh, recently on the COVID-19 uh, case. Uh, and they found that it holds for the first few uh, months of the pandemic. However, when we look at the long-term effect of the COVID-19, it uh, seems like the effect is quite controversial. So some people say, oh, actually the psychological effect, uh, the negative effect is kind of strong even long after the pandemic ends while other uh, people say well actually we don't we underestimate the recovery abilities of humans and resilience in the face of traumatic experiences is more common than we believe so this is exactly what we are trying to investigate in our work and these are the three research questions we came up with um, first is we want to see um, how these online users' um, emotions, uh, expressed emotions changed over the, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic and what were the long-term effects of it on the psychological states of the users. And more importantly, we also want to know what people were actually talking about during these kind of changes. So in order to do so, we collected the data set and we collected uh, user timelines from the Twitter uh, in order to uh, focus more on the individual emotional fluctuations in a window of uh, like three and a half years window, which covers both like pre-pandemic and post-pandemic post time. We um, identified that most like almost 6% of our entire data set is related to COVID-19 uh, um, identified by uh, these keywords that you can see on the screen. And you can see that um, most of the COVID tweets were posted uh, right in the beginning of the pandemic where people were so excited about it. And then it kind of dropped and became um, and stayed constant over time. Also, we employed the state of the art machine learning model in order to classify our each tweet in the data set into five emotional um, classes, which is joy, optimism, and anger, disgust, and fear. So if we look at our data set in terms of these five emotions, on the figure on the left side, you can see that mostly general tweets turned out to be quite positive, um, like having joy and optimism, except for maybe two points in this uh, periods and uh, with the high negative spikes which are actually related to the George Floyd's protests in the US and also the US Capitol attack. Um, COVID-19 tweets though, they have quite different emotional compositions, especially in the beginning, we can see that they are highly uh, 
prevalent with the negative emotions like anger, disgust, and fear, which spike in the beginning, then they drop um, and remain like constant over a long time. And even um, in the later part of the pandemic, we can see that they interchange with the positive emotions as well. So after this exploratory analysis, we thought, okay, let's look at the um, individual changes. So um, in order to do so, we thought, we thought that we can divide users into their emotional groups by using k-means clustering. And we found that we can divide them into positive, neutral, and negative groups. And here, neutral meaning the, these are the users who usually don't express any emotions in their um, posts. So first we uh, conducted analysis to see whether these five emotional um, distributions changed before and after uh, the, the COVID-19. And we found that for all emotional groups, actually the change was significant, but the effect size was very small. So we cannot really claim that there was a significant, I mean, very big change in emotional distributions. So in order to dig a little bit deeper, we tried to see how people were persist, consistent in expressing their emotions over time on a monthly basis. And we calculated the persistent scores and plotted them over time for each emotional group. And we found that the change in persistence uh, actually was quite negligible for all user groups. And finally, we also wanted to see, okay, uh, what about the groups? And who are the people who changed their emotional groups before and after the COVID um, pandemic? And we found that mostly uh, like more than 70% of the users actually remain in their own uh, same emotional groups. And only 2% of users cross cut between positive and negative groups, which is not a big number. Meaning people stay in their emotional states. So you might be wondering, uh, contrary to our intuition, COVID-19 didn't have this huge uh, negative e uh, effect on the users in general. So uh, why don't we look closely to the uh, role of COVID-19 in this kind of, uh, in the emotional effects. So uh, we further focus on the COVID-19 tweets and you can see from the distribution of the positive and negative emotions that actually the strongs model also uh, holds in our case. So it started with a fear phase with initial panic, uncertainty, and caused spike in dominant emotions for positive and negative groups. Then it was followed by the interpretation phase where people actually reacted very negatively to the situation, regardless of the emotional group. And so even in the positive group, users replied quite negatively about the situation. Nevertheless, this period was uh, followed by the action phase where people kind of accepted the situation and um, came into the emotional recovery step, so to say. And when we look at the further later parts of the pandemic, we can see, oh, actually, uh, we found that people in the positive group, they continued to post positive tweets and people in the negative group, they continued to post negative tweets. So people uh, were kind of persistent um, in their emotional expressions. So now you may be wondering, uh, what were the topics that people discussed during this kind of changes, this kind of uh, stages? So in order to see that, we uh, used bird topic model in order to analyze the topics in the COVID-19 tweets. And we identified nine major topics discussed uh, about COVID-19. You can see from this uh, plus that in red, in the beginning of the pandemic, people were discussing China a lot. And most of the users who discussed China were, uh, were the people from the negative group. And the tweets were mostly like blaming China for starting the outbreak. In the later parts of the pandemic, we can see that everyone, all users and all groups, they were discussing um, topics related to vaccinations and masks. And although both positive and negative um, group was, were really into the discussions of this topic, they um, framed it from 
very different points of view. So positive group was more excited and optimistic about the vaccination, while negative group was most focused on the um, possible side effects or the failure of uh, vaccination campaigns. When we look at the positive group, we can see that mostly uh, this group was uh, focused on the topics like healthcare, trying to post something about the healthcare workers try to support them or thank them, uh, or about the testing sites, trying to share some information where they can, where people can get the PCR tests. Negative group though, uh, had very different topics to discuss. So they were mostly discussing the death tolls due to COVID-19 and also the politics and they were like discussing some politicians who failed to deal with the pandemic situation and et cetera. So to sum up, we can see that um, actually in the long run, people started to discuss specific topics with consistent emotional patterns. And it depended on the emotional groups that they were in. So positive people discussed certain topics like health, healthcare and testing, while negative people, they'd like to negatively uh, discuss like types of China politics and death. And this, um, uh, this picture is actually quite uh, related to the concept of confirmation bias, which is uh, saying that uh, simply people are highly likely to focus on the topics that are actually already uh, aligned with what they believe in. So this is how we conceptualize uh, the term emotion bubbles, uh, which we define as a manifestation of users' emotionally motivated confirmation bias. And we say that because of this emotion bubbles, people actually um, become very resistant, uh, like emotionally resistant, to the external interventions, interventions like pandemic, in the long in the long run, and um, they focus on specific topics and try to interpret them in their own, from their own perspectives. So, and this kind of findings can have several implications to the policymakers or uh, public messaging campaigns uh, in order to design better emotional aid policies to support people. Uh, while considering their emotional group and the topics that they are mostly concerned with. So this is it uh, for the presentation. Thanks so much for uh, listening and I welcome any questions or suggestions. Awesome, thank you so much Asim. Uh, great work, very relevant and very timely as well. So we have plenty of time for, uh, for questions. I can, uh, I can get the discussion started and then others can jump in as well. So uh, ask him any, any insights on whether uh, with the advent of vaccines and more uptake of vaccines, how the emotional uh, discussions have, how the sentiment of population has changed or evolved over time? Yeah, so actually, um, yeah, if we look at this graph, you would see what we found interesting is that both groups were discussing vaccines and masks. Um, they were both interested, but people tried to discuss it from their own perspectives. And people who were discussing other things, like before COVID-19 negatively, they continued to discuss vaccines and masks also negatively. And positive people who were before very positive, they continued to discuss these topics from the positive perspective. So um, I think this is, uh, something interesting and if you want to uh, because this is a very relevant topic and when you want to uh, like uh, explain people why vaccinations are important you should also take into account that people are quite um, like they already have their own view of the topic so you have to be quite careful in order to uh, choose your words so awesome. that they don't get offended or something like that. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, other questions for Asim? Uh, there's a question from Alex, I believe. All right. Or it might be for the previous talk. I'm not sure. No, no, that it is. It is for this one. I just, I just didn't want to take up all the time again. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's fine. We have time for uh, this one. 
So, um, so, so I find it kind of fascinating because um, I know that in in semantic language detection stuff, there's a lot of issues when it comes to figuring out uh, sort of in between things like humor and sarcasm, and and that can sort of have an impact on how accurately we can determine whether something is positive or negative. So, could you maybe touch a little bit upon how um, these models? Uh, see these issues because uh, I'd be really interested in, in it, especially since one of the examples from death, for example, was more factual uh, right, right. rather than negative. Yeah, actually, this is something um, we discussed in the paper, but we didn't really have time to discuss here. What we found uh, since we used the machine learning model, which was trained on the tweets that are are not relevant, they are not related to the COVID-19, we found that it sometimes it misinterpreted some um, words, for example, testing positive uh, was uh, classified as a positive tweet, although it's definitely not uh, in the positive, like people don't share, I am tested positive and they are not happy about it. So we think this is uh, actually like a future direction for the machine learning models in order to capture the sentiment changes in the language itself during this kind of uh, long-term disasters. And yeah, I think it's also very um, tricky uh, when you come to the specific words uh, that ha has to do with the topic. So I think maybe you have to go manually and choose some um, frequently used uh, words like testing positive or death tolls and then see if the model can predict it accurately or not. Yeah, we kind of went through them qualitatively and so like, see okay this sounds um like this makes sense or this doesn't make sense <laughs> yeah 